Hello, everyone, and welcome to this TWT TV and Left Book Club discussion on Yara Rodriguez Fowler's novel and a discussion about socialist literature. Um, today, we'll be discussing and um, using uh, this book as also a bit more of a, a bit of a springboard to discuss um, some other themes, uh, important themes. The novel is There Are More Things, and it's a novel about two women, Melissa and Katrina, and it's about history, revolution, and love. Um, if you get to read it, it's in it we see sisterhood and queerness and perhaps a glimpse of a better way to live. Um, we're going to start off with um, a reading uh, uh, from the book by Yara, Rodri Yara Rodriguez Fowler, who is the author of the book. And Yara is a writer from South London. Her first novel, novel, Stubborn Archivist, was released in 2019 and nominated for several prizes, including the Dylan Thomas Prize and the Sunday Times Young Writer of the Year Award. Yara's second novel, which we'll be discussing today, is There Are More Things. It was shortlisted as a work in progress for the Eccles Centre and Hay Festival Writers Award. Since its release in April 2022, There Are More Things has been shortlisted for the George Orwell Prize for Political Fiction. Yara is also a part-time climate justice organiser. After uh, we hear a reading uh, from Yara, Wendy Liu will be reacting to the book and um, talk a bit about why the book re particularly resonates with her. And Wendy Liu is the author of Abolish Silicon Valley, How to Liberate Technology from Capitalism, which is a memoir and a manifesto about the tech industry. She is working on a novel about the same subject too. So without further ado, over to you, Yara. Um, hello. Um, all right, I'm going to do a short reading. Don't worry, it's not too long. Um, so this book has got, just a bit of background, um, sort of two narrative strands, I guess. So one is about these two young women, uh, Melissa and Katerina, who meet in London um, in, a, in like a flat share in my land. Um, and then there's also another section sort of slimmer and it feels slightly different that's set during um, sort of the most repressive part of Brazil's dictatorship period um, and as the novel kind of gets towards its end like we realise how the two strands are connected um, and yeah so I'm going to read from um, that second part. So this section is called. I'm just. I'm not going to read the whole section, obviously. Um, this bit is from the section called Pedaço de Mim, um, 1969 to 74, um, and it's set in Brazil. One. A woman at the side of the road with no bag on her back, tall. Her skin is light brown, young, chin high. A woman in a blue beetle car with dark hair around her face and her foot on the pedal. Her skin is worn out white. The night time is purple. Get in. You will drive. I will drive. How far? 200 kilometres, 300 tomorrow. To where? A safe house. Where? West of here. No interior de Pernambuco. You have said goodbye to everyone. I have. The woman in the driver's seat starts the engine. She says, what should I call you? Clytemnestra. What? Clytemke? I can't call you that. It's not even Brazilian. What is it? It is an ancient Greek name from Greece. Greece? No, you cannot. Why not? You know why not. You must have a name that disappears just as you must disappear. A name that dissolves into the air after it is spoken. Maria or Erna. If you want, you may make it diminutive like Aninha. If the great communist leader Carlos Marighella can be Professor Menezes, why can I not be? Carlos Marighella was killed. What? It happened yesterday. No, it is a lie. It's always a lie to demoralize us. Open the glove compartment. That is today's newspaper. Morto o chefe terrorista Marighella. There is a picture of his body inside. You will have to be Maria or Erna. Silence. Inside the car is dark. 
The woman in the driver's seat turns the steering wheel. I carry his writings with me everywhere. Marigella, yes. Clytemnesta wipes her face with the back of her hand. Why did you want this name, Clytemnestra? She was a warrior, killer of kings. You want to kill kings. I believe in revolution. The woman with her hands on the steering wheel looks at her. I can call you Clytemnestra, but only when we are alone. Clytemnestra looks at her. But you must respond to Maria in public. Clytemnestra nods. The other woman smiles. Clytemnestra, killer of kings. They hit a bridge. The traffic around them slows. On the other side is a military blockade. A young man with close-cropped hair, military police, holds a gun the length of his torso. He looks ahead at them, and they look at him through the windows of the car. Black boots. Clytemnestra, killer of kings, says, Merda, merda. Do not worry, they will not stop us. Isha, do not worry. It's the poli police, their boots. Don't worry, breathe. They pass through the blockade, glide, into the outskirts of the city, bad housing. The woman in the driver's seat sits back. She pulls the wig of black hair from her head, revealing brown short hair underneath. For the first time, Clytemnestra, killer of kings, sees her properly, her mouth and eyes and nose illuminated and then dark, illuminated and then dark again in the headlights of passing cars. And Clytemnestra, killer of kings, says, Menina. And Clytemnestra, killer of kings, is speaking, turning her body in her seat, her hands on the dashboard, Carlos Marigella's dead body on the newspaper sheets falling to the floor of the car. You are the governor's daughter. You are the famous revolutionary. I did not recognize you in your black wig, but it is you. I, is it true what the newspaper said? That you killed one of the military police right in the center of the forehead. Bang. Is this why you are running? I know your name. I've read it in the newspaper. How is your father? He is a good man. I know your name. And Clytemnestra, killer of kings, is saying the other woman's name. She shouts it. Louder. Laura, the famous revolutionary, exhales. Foot on the pedal. She looks at the young woman to her right. Uh, cool, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much for that, Yara. Um, Wendy, would you like to react to that a bit and yeah, tell us a bit about why you think the book resonates with you? Sure, sure thing. Is, it, is this working? Yes, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I for a moment I forgot where I was. I was just in the car with these women. I think what I so what I loved the most about the book was the way there's this. You do this thing where you 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 have a lot that is set in a very contemporary, very familiar setting for anyone who's lived in London. So it's set in 2010s London. You know, people are living in really awful flats and they're dealing with the indignities of everyday life. They don't have a lot of money. They don't have a lot of security. But there is um, some interesting political developments happening. But then at the same time, there's so much of the book is either in the shadow of or explicitly in revolutionary Brazil. And I think the fact that you have these two stories, these two settings in parallel, it on the one hand, it really it makes it clear that the past is not that is not that far away. It's not that distant. And the people who are in London in, in um, organizing in their own way today, they are influenced by these past struggles, um, both explicitly and and implicitly. And so I think the the fact that you show this very bleak, dreary, everyday humdrum existence in London, but also show this much more potent revolutionary time, it really helps, for me at least, it illuminates the possibility for struggle even in a time like this. And reminds us that we don't have to accept this sort of bleak existence forever, that there are possibilities for um, being these, I guess, like revolutionary subjects and being able to see the world differently and not just say, oh, this is just my existence, I'm resigned to it. And I especially found um, the one of the one of the characters who, uh, I, I don't want to spoil too much about the book, but who's introduced at the beginning. And when she's introduced at the beginning, she's seen as this um, sort of powerless figure. And she's clearly in a, in a situation where society has relegated her to a position of almost worthlessness because, you know, she is a 
foreign racialized woman. She does not have a lot of money. She does not have a lot of status. And as a result, I think the reader, you know, we read this and we're like, we just can't sort of remember that society places certain types of people in these roles where they, they're seen as not capable of anything. And, you know, you almost feel, you, you feel pity for this person. And, but then as the novel develops, you start to realize that this woman um, actually is capable of much more than society normally sees her as capable of. And and so I think this this narrative shift that you do, it really foregrounds the agency, not of just this woman, but of so many other people who are consigned to these um, these really awful roles in society and are, they're just not given the power, they're not given the recognition that they deserve. And so, you know, as the, the novel develops and you see this woman, you start to realize how just how brave she is and how intelligent and how much she's gone through and how she is as much a revolutionary subject as anyone else, despite the fact that, you know, she's not usually seen as such. And even on the left, I think it's, there are a lot of people who find it hard to see for example, like an older woman who maybe works in um, in a role where she's not making much money and she is care she's caring for her children, um, it's sometimes easy to just think of people like that as oh they're they're not really that important they're not the ones who are going to lead us they're not the ones who are going to theorize and make change happen instead you know it's going to be the the powerful powerful men for example, uh, and I think it's your novel is just this wonderful beautiful reminder that we don't have to see things that way just because capitalism wants us to think that way um wow you're just uh everything i would have hoped for from a reader <laughs> um i i guess there are like a couple of things there um that have made me you know think of something but um the first thing is it was very important to me i suppose my first book is quite slim and it's very much kind of about one woman and uh, withholding information and resisting domination um, through kind of the novel, I suppose, um, or resisting the way that the novel can be a form of domination. Um, whereas this book, I was much more interested in this idea of like, okay, what if I wrote something really quite long? And the book is quite, quite sort of chunky, ch chunky guy. And like, I, what if... Um, I was able to create a really expansive sense of time um, for the reader, not just because it actually would take them a little chunk of their life to read it, um, but also I wanted to um, remind the reader that very much within living memory, revolutionary movements were so prominent that whole kind of empires and were mobilized dictatorships established to crush them um and i think certainly on the left in the uk but under neoliberalism uh, we're not meant to have such expansive ambitious political horizons we're meant to think like oh god i, I hope i wish austerity would get a bit reversed um so that was part of what i wanted to do which was to say like our foremothers whether you know literally our foremothers or not um gave their whole lives to the revolutionary struggle and like in some instances really got quite close um yeah and i wanted to kind of zoom out of the current political moment and use the novel to do that work um yeah i think i think um the way you unearth history is i, I mean i i don't uh i don't remember reading a novel that affected me this way i think it's it was it was quite quite profound for me because um, and this is something I've been thinking about a lot in my own work where I'm also trying to figure out how to unearth um, historical struggles to relate them to the current moment and inspire people to take action in a way that mm. is feels almost impossible within the current horizons of you know neo atomized consumerist uh, neoliberalism and I think something you you do with the way you unearth history and you show that these people who have created change and have fought and struggled in the past are not just these bronze statues that are unrelated to the way people are now. I think you really show how these people, they struggled with a lot of the same things that we do now and in a different way. And they were in a different era. Things were different, but still there's so much that binds us. There's so much commonality. And, you know, we, we understand through this novel, we, we realize, we really see how the people 
who were in these struggles before, they were flawed. They were unsure. Mm-hmm. They had mm-hmm. doubts. They weren't really sure what they were doing. They weren't really sure if they were doing anything right or if it was totally worthless. They they were really struggling, and it wasn't a matter of um, some great, powerful person who was destined from birth to become this revolutionary subject. It was just a matter of people making these small choices, making sacrifices, making and, and you know making these decisions to act out of solidarity with the people they cared about. And that's something that's accessible to us in the here and now. It's not something we should just think of as a matter of the history books. It's something that, you know, maybe our ancestors and our our yeah, four foremothers, as you say, the people close to us have been thinking about these things too and they've been trying to respond the best way they can. I mean everyone everyone in the novel is very human, is mm very flawed is very wounded is struggling with so many things but at the same time everyone has this little um little kernel of possibility where Mm -hmm. they think you know i'm i don't have to be the same way forever i don't Mm -hmm. have to be the person that society expects me to be Mm -hmm. i am um, a human being and what that means is that i'm capable of change and i'm capable of committing to something Mm -hmm. bigger than myself in a way that could lead to something much bigger than i can achieve on my own and so i think that's something I took away from the novel which I found so moving and and inspiring oh thank you (laughs) um yeah uh if it's like if I can be permitted to just nerd out for a bit um so I wrote a lot of it um during lockdown or the writing bit rather than the kind of conceptual and planning and all of that stuff um and I'd been hoping to go to Brazil and do all of this research there but instead I was on my little computer, my laptop in my bedroom, um, looking at just like there's so many interesting documents out there that are just so uh, ripe for fictionalization. And I was thinking a lot of um, Sadia Hartman's practice of critical fabulation, where she looks at archival material and then kind of imagines these very like wonderful, like kind of fabulous lives for, in her case, um, like black women in, I think, New York. Um, but and obviously I'm doing fiction, so I've got a bit, a lot more leeway, I would say. But um, so, for example, there's the Brazilian government's Truth Commission report that was written in 2014 about state violence that occurred um, under the military dictatorship and in some of the periods before. And this is like actually remarkably accessibly written. It is in, obviously in Portuguese. Um, and there was a lot of detail there that I was able to find about. Um, so, for example... This is not just in Brazil, it's across Latin America, but there are, you know, there's a lot of literature, there's a lot of films about um, the revolutionary struggle, the anti-dictatorship struggle, anti-imperialist struggle in the 1960s through to 80s. Um, And there were a lot of, um, you know, bourgeois middle class people, class traitors that then joined the struggle, did their thing, whatever. And and we rightly celebrate them. Um, But what... I was discovering reading this is like, so let's say you were a blacklisted trade unionist. Um, You would, in Brazil, under the military dictatorship, um, be unable to find work, have to leave your city, and there would be no documentation of you. Um, And I was interested in, like, those women in particular and those, like, working class trade unionists that would have had that experience that is... Um, just as violent and painful, I would argue, as being, you know, tortured in a basement, um, that no one will make a film about you or really know that that's what happened to you necessarily. Um, And I was also interested in the experiences of queer people. Um, So I had very long discussions with my mum where she shared a lot of stories about her experience with her best friend, um who was gay in the movement and how the revolutionary movements treated uh, people who were gay. Um, And so I wanted to be able to sort of show all of the kind of resistance and power and possibility of those movements, but also say, like, look, what we're struggling for is going to be even better. Um, um, And um, there's this incredible document that... um, So there were these revolutionaries who... um, went to try and establish a liberated zone during the dictatorship uh, in the forest. You know, they were like rural uh, rather than urban guerrillas. And, um, you know, it's like if me and you were like, let's get some Kalashnikovs and go. Like, they were really not uh, ready for it, (laughs) um, let's say. 
and um and they were all massacred by the Brazilian government after about three years. And um but there's this document one of the guys there kept a diary and um the government, the Brazilian state seized it and then it was leaked to a journalist in two thousand and eleven. And I contacted him and he was like, obviously, I'm not going to tell you my sources. And I was like, okay, fair enough. But it's all online, just like as a kind of PDF, like the equivalent of like Tribune just uploading this PDF kind of thing. Like, And um, I was reading it and it speaks to what you were saying because it would be like, uh, when we had a party, this is what we ate and what kind of music we had. And we ate like this turtle that we caught <laughs> and in the forest. And, you know, the local people came and we danced together. And uh, we all had diarrhea because like we're not used to eating cashew milk. And um, they all used to listen to um, Radio Tirana, like an Albanian radio station that was like always bigging them up. And they so they would listen to this radio station that we'd be like, yeah, so, you know, like solidarity to our like amazing comrades in Brazil and the forest. Um, so, yeah, it was a very cool, nerdy time that I had um, delving into all of those kind of documents and then writing around it. Um, so, yeah. Um, and then one last thing I wanted to mention about the book is, so, I mean, the thing about literature is that it can be quite a lonely endeavor sometimes, right? You can just read books on your own and not talk to anyone about it. And maybe, maybe the stuff you're reading about feels like it sort of enhances that loneliness, like depending on what you're reading, right? It, it doesn't necessarily, um, obviously extend itself to a collective endeavor, but I think what I appreciated about There Are More Things is that there is a lot of depiction of collective organizing within the book. And I think there's something about that that um, I found, uh, you know, just very inspiring. And it, it made me want to go out and be around people because the way it's depicted is it's shown as such the, uh, such a, a wonderful alternative to the, the kind of like lonely, individual, individualized, atomized, and precarious existence that some of the people in the book face. And so for them, you know, this ability to come together and organize in support of something that they believe in in order to try to build the world, reshape the world into what they want it to be, that for them it's it's not just a matter of the um, the political goals and it's not just a matter of being around other people who they, they want to be around. It's, it's the fusing of the two. And there's something so powerful in this expression of collective joy and the in the hopes of making collective change. Um, and yeah, and I think that's something that uh, more literature should aspire to because especially, I mean, socialist literature for sure s certainly should try to get people to, you know, come away with this feeling that like, oh, I can I can be part of something. I don't have to um, be lonely and like in individualized forever. There is a better world out there and I want to know what it is I can do to make that. And so I think your book definitely leaves, left me with that feeling. And I yeah, hope more novels are written with that aim in mind. Um, I'll just say two things really quickly about that. Firstly, um, yeah, I really wanted to represent that um, we create these like small utopias all the time. And that's how we know that a bigger one is possible. Like that feeling that you get when you're on the picket line, you're at a protest or like even like having dinner with your friends and is your chosen family like, that's or you're in the club like that's how you know that like oh okay yes we could all live like way better than this and, and so I really wanted the book to be full of that and and that was how I was experiencing my life at the time um and yeah like I would go to Wendy's reading group and it, we would in the, I was doing all of these things with other people and I was organizing with different activist groups um and I wanted to recreate that feeling, but also not say, oh, well, well, it only occurred, you know, when Jeremy Corbyn was leader. Like, I wanted to be like, look, history is long. <laughs> um, and everything didn't end with 2019. Um, and the other thing that I kind of wanted briefly to say is that I think this thing about um, the book being a collective thing goes back to also this, the way I think about reading and writing, um, which is like to kind of take a materialist analysis of it. Um, like the book is a material object. It's not like an abstract text. And we often talk about books as abstract texts that we read alone and that happen to fall into our laps and we're having this sort of like telepathic experience with the author. But actually, no, a book is a material object. You're reading it in the real world. Um, it is given meaning by the world around it. That meaning is socially determined. Um, so I didn't want people to have this experience of like, oh, I've gone to the fantasy land of the book. I put it down and then I carry on with my life. I want it to be like, no, this book ha has a materiality. Like... 
it's got little bits from Brazil and from England. It's got recipes. It's got political chants in it. Um, like, I want to feel agitated and full of desire that's going to exist in the real world. Um, so, yes. Thank you so much for those thoughts and that discussion. It was so, um, yeah, it's, I, I was really enjoying hearing the exchange about um, the your book in particular, but also the broader themes and the need for, um, you know, imagining otherwise, essentially. And um, so, you know, I work for the Left Book Club, but what I do mostly, my, my most of my life is being an activist of the Kurdish women's movement, which um, a large part of it is obviously this work of imagining otherwise, uh, particularly in terms of, um, you know, leading a well, revolution and leading a revolutionary movement that um, also, you know, the, the largest aim of it is to mobilize um, uh, an entire nation and beyond. And what I found what I found really, um, really inspiring about your exchange, but also um, the book and, uh, you know, other books and um, and literature that um, endeavours to do this as well is this, um, you know, this giving credit to uh, histories and struggles that often don't get that credit. And therefore, you know, what you what you just said, Yara, about, you know, history doesn't end and so on. And also, um and also you know the way to approach struggle um uh, you know essentially and therefore that we don't have to recreate the wheel of course and history is alive as long as we keep it alive and also throughout history you know for centuries and centuries there has obviously always been um you know people resisting people struggling revolutions happening and uh, almost every time, of course, women have been um, at the forefront of these of these uh, struggles and these revolutions and resistances. And it's given it's about giving credit to that. It's it's to say that this exists and it exists because we're also saying it existed and we are going to make our own history and keep that history alive in our present as well in the way we discuss it, but also in the way we engage struggle in in the in the present. And um what I thought, what what I also thought was really inspiring and uh, I think incredible, and I'm not sure if you were necessarily trying to do this with the book, is this uh, this like you know capability of change and transformation, and actually how you know we 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 don't we we don't the way, for example, we talk about abolition is only when we're talking about abolition, but we forget that obviously abolition is about is about uh, the entire transformation of society and how we relate to each other and the world and so on, uh, and therefore imagining um, a way to live um, outside of capitalism and um, and neoliberal capitalism and, you know, racial capitalism. And I think, you know, the more we're talking about the ability and the possibility and how we can actually transform ourselves and society, we're also contributing the for, to the towards the struggle for abolition as well. And of course, that's not just about, you know, prison abolition and police abolition, but how do we actually do this? So, yeah, I, I I would actually like to hear if if when you were when you were doing that you were necessarily thinking about that or you it's it's you know it's it's kind of a it's a result of actually wanting to do a book of like you know imagining otherwise and bringing these histories and these um and these uh, relations that often are not um you know are not brought alive. Uh, yeah, and you know, and the the, the human element of it. Um, okay, so I want to make sure I'm like getting to the heart of what you're asking. Like, did I set out being like, um, like, what did I have like properly like kind of transformative ambitions like for the reader when they're reading, um, and how they like imagine what the world could be. Yeah, I suppose. And did you think did you think that that, you know, that was uh, a contribution to the struggle for abolition? Right. 
Um, I guess, in short, yes. Like, I suppose, um, you know, like some people I speak to would say, you know, there's no point having any kind of political ambition for your book because it's just a piece of literature, like no one, no one gives a shit. Like, um, but I... I just think, like, why not? Like, if I'm interested in revolutionary action in other parts of my life, then why wouldn't I, like, give that a go? In literature, it would be, like, I, you know, what's the point of not, not doing that? So I think, yes, I did tentatively think, like, yeah, I want to, like, just throw it all into this book and see if what happens, like... And, you know, some people do message me being like, oh, I've gone to an anti raids meeting or, like, whatever, um, which is wicked. Um... And yes, I think I was, I was writing an explicitly abolitionist book, um, partially because um, when I stopped, I realised like, all right, so state violence in Brazil didn't begin and end with the dictatorship, right? Like, particularly against indigenous people and black people. Um, so, and at the same time as. So I, I, you know, because of my mum, I was very interested in preserving the history of the dictatorship. But then when I actually came to looking at the history of state violence in Brazil, I realised that, that it, it, it's not that I wanted to write, not it's not that it's important to write about the dictatorship full stop or per se, but actually the dictatorship is the way we talk about one very kind of clearly historically marked period of intense state violence. But actually, um, I guess the broader like position that I'm writing from is like the abolition of state violence or against state violence. Um, and there's actually a passage in the book, and this is particularly thinking about prison abolish abolition, but there's a passage in the book where, um, and this is based on, and this is at the back of the book, like it sort of says where or what's true historically and where I got a lot of this material from. But I was talking to my mum and she remembers being in an activist meeting in um, the I think, late, late 60s. So before, um, before there was a political amnesty where everyone was forgiven, you know, the communists were forgiven and the torturers were forgiven. Um, and... Um, that had been a demand for a long time, political amnesty. And um, amnesty for people who had been, who were political prisoners. And my mom had this story, which is, uh, she was at a meeting and it was in the university and it was mostly university students. And this guy came to the meeting and this is fictionalized, like I gave it to one of the characters in the book, but um, this guy comes to the meeting, he's wearing a suit, no one else is wearing a suit. Like he's got darker skin than most of the people there. He's very nervous, really nervous to speak. He's like shaking. And he says, I am from the movement of common prisoners. Mm -hmm. Like we are abused too. We also experience state violence. Can we be included in your amnesty? And the students in the room voted no because it wasn't strategic. Um, but from the point of view of the book, like that's like a error. Like there isn't a, di like there is all state violence and there should be solidarity between them. Um, and that's how the book kind of presents that moment um, as like a failure of solidarity. Um, but and the other thing is that at the same time in my life, I was quite active in um, the, I guess, like my sort of introduction to the left was really, uh, or my own activism was via um, a domestic violence sector. And through the domestic violence sector, you really see how you go from being like, um, oh, give us more funding, British government, to being like, oh, well, and what do we do with this funding? Oh, yeah, we fight the British government, the hostile environment, and, um, you know, benefit cuts and cuts to housing benefit and um, so many different types of assaults on migrant rights and the ways that the state makes it harder for a woman to leave an abusive partner. Um, so I guess I was very much writing this book, um, anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist, but also very much like against state violence. I mean, that's really like a big focus of it, I suppose, if that answers your question at all. Um, yeah. I mean, thank you very much for that. I think, yeah, I mean, it definitely answers the question. And um, yeah, it's really great to hear hear you also hear like the process um, that you had in, in writing the book in that way as well. Um, one of the things that I also want to ask is 
you know, if we're talking about also imagining otherwise, I guess um, it would be nice to know, uh, you know, some of the other, uh, you know, some of the, some other literature, whether it's fiction or theory, that um, that you both believe is important to you, and that influences you. And I think, I suppose, particularly in terms of, you know, like it, literature that also you think or you for you it was like almost like. Um, like a call to action when you when you read it. Uh, Wendy, should we start with you? Sure, yeah. Um, so some works of fiction that I really like. Um, so this one, this one American author named Rachel Kushner, she's written a few books uh, that are quite radical, but also just really interesting as literature, which I think is something that is quite hard to pull off because... Um, not everyone is interested in like kind of fusing the two, but she has a book about the Cuban revolution called Telex from Cuba, which is stunning because I mean it, the way it talks about the revolution is it just, it, uh, much of the book is the perspective of some of the Americans who are on this, um, island in Cuba and they are the, the children of the, um, executives of the American corporation that is really just like pillaging, pillaging the island and subjugating the people who live there. And you have the, the, the innocence of these children who are just like, oh, this is how the world is. You know, um, my father just happens to own the whole island and we have 18 servants and uh, all the workers are unhappy. And I can't imagine why, how strange. And I think just having the innocence of these children just detail how horrific the conditions are, it really forces the reader to see this something that is um you know has been propagandized by mainstream depictions as just oh like uh you know how how ungrateful the natives are that uh like a, this american comp company is like helping them and so i think it really just forces a shift in perspective for, especially um or even for someone who has never encountered any sort of like left-wing critique of anything before you know the reading a book like this uh, that forces you to look through the eyes of someone who can't understand why this revolution could possibly take place, it is hard to, uh, as a reader, to just to support these people because then you're like, okay, yeah, I, this this child is clearly in the wrong. So I think that was beautiful. She has a book called um, The Flamethrowers, which, among other things, features these factory workers in Italy in the 70s who are in the middle of their of um, all these revolutionary um, labor movements. And then you, there's a book called The Mars Room, which is about the California prison system and it's it's a very i mean i think it'd be fair to describe it as an abolitionist book it is very much a book that understands the harsh reality of these prisons and isn't it isn't sugarcoating just how difficult they are and how little um how little room there is for the people within them to experience any joy in it but that they're, they're still capable of doing it but that at the same time you know the the structure is set up in such a way that it really doesn't add anything of value to society. And I think that's that's like a very powerful aspect of the book. Um, and then just a few other, I mean, not exactly literature, but there's a there's a memoir called A Surf's Journal by Terry Tapp. And it's quite incredible. I, I don't think it's very well known. I wish it was more well known, but it's a memoir of um, the this person who was working at uh, as, as a shipbuilder and ended up going on this lo really long wildcat strike. And the way he talks about his experience of work and how he didn't go into the job expecting to go on strike. He wasn't thinking, oh, I'm you know just gonna salt and we're just gonna strike. It was very much a process of um, being in the reality of this really harsh reality of work and talking to his fellow workers and then them all sort of collectively deciding that there were possibilities open for them. And so you feel this moment of transformation in the book as you see all these people decide, oh, we don't have to just sit down and take it. We can be these, you know, kind of revolutionary agents and force change to happen. We don't have to just be passive. We can make our own history. We can make the world shift around us. And it's just so powerful and moving and so beautifully written. So I yeah, that's that's something that meant a lot to me. And then in terms of theory, I mean, there's so much, there's so much um, really beautiful theory out there that is written in a way that's almost literary. That you know, where you can really feel like you're in the moment. And so, Black Reconstruction by W. B. Du Bois is just one of my favorite examples. Um, and this is a book that is written about the the Civil War and the aftermath of the Civil War in the United States, uh, and the way it really plunges you into what life was like for 
um, some of the, the people who were working on these plantations and how for them it wasn't just a matter of, um, you know, sort of passively waiting for the the Union Army to come in and liberate them, that for a lot of a lot of these people who were essentially workers, they were workers subjected to horrible conditions, they decided that they could essentially go on strike. And I think that the way that Du Bois depicts this, it's just, it feels like literature. You don't feel like you're reading a dry academic text. You feel like you're you're there in this moment in history and that, you know, it really just, it, it's incredibly inspiring incredibly beautiful and just like very theoretically sharp so um oh this is so exciting i'm gonna pick up all those books um yeah i think um just a bit of like not just a tiny mini rant i think i get very um it's become sort of marketable to call things activist or radical that are not particularly ra radical or activist i think in the kind of fiction world um the bar is very low so like two things that are really considered or described as radical activist are um, representation. So this is by uh, an author that is minoritized in some way or another or about people who are, um, or if a book is relatable. Um, but neither of these things, I mean, the bar is on the floor. These things are, um, neither of them are particularly radical um, and or like interesting political ambitions for our fiction, really. Um, and I think also there is a real importance and power in depicting our material conditions, which these books don't necessarily do accurately, um, or they mistake um, the ma like material circumstances for interpersonal, like our lives are not just determined by interpersonal uh, relationships. Um, so yeah, there, there can be a great power in depicting material conditions, but I think like what is really revolutionary is to communicate that something else is possible to the reader. Um, and that was, that's what makes kind of something, something that's what differentiates kind of trauma porn or whatever from, um, yeah, something revolutionary and what I find really exciting. Um, so anyway, having said that, I think, um, I completely agree with you about works of theory that read like literature. Something that I was reading while writing this book was, um, the romance of American communism, which I absolutely love. And I, I thought you might even say it because it, like, yeah, I mean, like they, it's completely unsuccessful movement like they do terrible things but when they're at the dinner table with each other like the way that there's a paragraph where it's like and so and so is a bus driver and so and so is a metal worker but at the table he was a poet and you get this feeling of of what they believe they can do and that's so what I wanted to create in the book um and I'm sure also for those of you familiar with Lola Olufemi's work about um experiments and imagining otherwise I was also very influenced by that um and again, like it being the role of literature. And she says this, that it's the role of the imagination in the revolutionary movements to like gesture at or indicate um, what is possible. Um, and then in terms of, um, I love Anna Burns. I mean, there's that bit in Milkman where they're all in this French lesson and they're taught to say the sky is blue and somebody goes, the sky isn't blue. Look at it. Look how many colors are in the sky. And they're all like, no, the sky's blue. And then suddenly they're like, oh my God, it's pink and it's purple and it's gray. And um, in that moment, she does what I've just been describing, but in the most sort of like mundane, everyday situation. Um, obviously, Arundhati Roy. Um, and then there are two really interesting writers writing in the UK. Um, Preeti Taneja, who writes about, she's got this book, um, We That Are Young, which is this, like fat, um, King Lear, set in like billionaire class in India um so she's really like taking aim at uh yeah the capitalist class and um Isabel Weidner I don't know if I'm pronouncing their name right but um their latest book Sterling Carrot Gold is like these like non-binary people there's like all the characters are non-binary there's just like abundance of gender queerness in their novel um and it's set on an estate in Camden at one point the spaceship lands and in then the narrator kind of interjects and talks about spaceship moments as kind of puncturing the kind of I think it was like the substandard fiction that we call the UK or something like that and I suppose every sort of revolutionary novel should have a spaceship moment I think whether it's a spaceship or not um so and then I also have um this artist, uh, Liv Winter, who is a poet and a theatre maker and an activist, and they have a night called um, How to Catch a Poet. Um, and it's hosted by them, but also this group called Ten Minute Tales. And they make like everyone in the audience write a little story in 10 minutes. And they also post them online. And they're all so like, anti-landlord and anti-capitalist, um, also really, really funny. 
Um, so that's also something I love because it's kind of saying everyone can have art and creativity in their lives. It's not something that we just only like people who have a publishing contract are allowed to do. So I also wanted to shout them out and say how much I love them. Thank you. Um, it re I mean, in obviously no surprise, clearly we um, all want a better world and that really comes through in um in you know what um inspires you both i want to have a quick go at this as well because um i found that really really interesting and actually there's like some stuff that i haven't heard before which kind of actually like makes me happy in a way that like there's like you know there's always so much out there that we don't really that we don't really know about so um i'm definitely going to um going to look into some of those and i wanted to talk about one of um something i read this summer actually for the first time i've been meaning to read it for a long time i just it was like a bit difficult to get hold of for some reason um for a while but it's a novel called the gardens of light by amin malouf and he's a um i think he's a lebanese writer if i'm not um mistaken and the book is about um a uh I think it's like a sixth or seventh century uh, prophet called Manny. And basically his um, his endeavor in trying to um, essentially create like a united faith in, in which like people can still um, practice their own uh, faiths and religions and so on. But actually there's like, there is a united principle in what makes us human. And actually it's 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 basically about his struggle. And I found it really really incredible to read and I think partly because I you know I have a bit of a um you know I have a I have a bit of a you know romantic approach when it comes to the Middle East in general and that and that history there and um and and you know also some of the mysticism that you know comes through in it so that was really amazing and I think one of the most inspiring books that I've read um probably like one of the most inspiring in my life is um the memoirs of a um Kurdish revolutionary called Sakine Jansas and the book is called Sara uh, my whole life was a struggle and it's published by Pluto the first and second volume I imagine the third volume will be coming out with them at some point so and it's like you know her her memoirs of her process of politicization and becoming a revolutionary. The second volume is um, about, you know, her time in uh, a Turkish prison and particularly um, around the 1980s fascist coup in Turkey. And it's absolutely her struggle is it almost feels like, you know, it, I don't understand how a person can actually struggle, like can actually struggle and resist to that degree. So it's like, it's all, it's like aspirational, but also like in, it, it really gives you a lot of strength when you read it. And I think, you know, theory that almost feels like literature, which I'm, I'm glad that like, you know, you both kind of like brought that as like a bit of a theme is what's come, like a book that came out last year by um, written by the late David Graeber and David Wengro, The Dawn of Everything. And it's basically um, a book that's essentially re, um, re you know, exploring or re-questioning the, um, the history of civilization. To, you know, this is a simplification of it. But I think um, it's absolutely incredible. It's kind of funny. They have fun with it. Um, they brought in a lot of um, indigenous research um, into it as well, like the research of indigenous uh, researchers um, across, um, you know, uh, North America. So it's absolutely incredible to read. And um, one of the other things that I would, one of the other books that I found really interesting, especially when I was at university, was reading um, the um the ethnography um of uh called, uh, the called night march of um uh Alpa Shah's experience with the Naxalites in, Naxalite guerrillas in India that was really really incredible so i yeah i suggest you all to read that and i think one of the things that why i love this discussion and talking about literature and you know whether it's fiction or theory or theory that feels like fiction and literature is because, yeah, one of the things that David Graeber would say is, you know, something that kind of 
um, differentiates like humans from you know animals is that we tend to imagine before we build a house for example you know an architect would will draw up plans before the house is built or you know you would imagine how you want your house to look before you do it and therefore we have the ability to imagine a different world and build it and I think you know especially in terms of socialist literature I think that's the role that it can really play um, in, you know, sure, we know what we're fighting against, you know, of course, um, you know, let's smash capitalism, let's smash the pa uh, patriarchal racial uh, capitalist state. But what do we what do we want to do in its place? So I think these kind of discussions and and these explorations really, um, you know, really serves that um, that struggle and that endeavor. So, yeah, thank you very much for this discussion. And um, I look forward to um getting into some of the books you both have suggested thank you so much yeah i can't thank wait you. either um what a pleasure to um have this discussion with you both yeah yeah thank you thank you i know i'm away but i'd like not in the room but it it really feels like it was a very nice and friendly discussion <laughs>